Um, so I'd like to call the October 4th meeting of the uh, Town of Arlington Redevelopment Board to order. This meeting of the Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, which was extended due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. For this meeting, the Redevelopment Board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So we will now confirm that all members are present and can hear me by taking a roll call Starting with Ken Lau. Present. Jean Benson. Present. Melissa Tintakalos. Present. Steve Revelak. Present. And I'm Rachel Zenberry. And we have uh, two members of the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development, uh, Jennifer Raitt. Present. And uh, Kelly Linema. Here. Great. Uh, Jenny, do we have anyone else joining us this evening? Um, the other staff person in this room is uh, Interim Director of Inspectional Services, Michael Champa. Champa, sorry. Great. Uh, well, welcome, Michael. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. So we will move right to uh, the first item uh, in our agenda, which is urban renewal planning. And um, I will invite uh, Jenny Rate to, um, to discuss this topic with the board. This is a follow-up to uh, the, the goal setting that we held on uh, September 11th, uh, where we discussed uh, further exploring the, um, the opportunities afforded to the redevelopment board uh, as the urban renewal authority uh, within the town of Arlington. Go ahead, Jenny, take it away. All right, um, thank you, Rachel. So uh, this is, as you can see, a presentation that I am gonna run through. It's really brief in terms of the, the history of the ARB, uh, some of the plans that we've had and some of the possibilities that we also have in uh, the future. So, is my screen not working? Okay. Um, so I'm going to sort of, this is bifurcated into two parts. The first part is just about urban renewal planning, and then we'll talk a little bit about blighted properties. So I'll probably pause between the two, um, just because they kind of go together, but um, I'd prefer to take questions separately. So I, I'm not, um, I, I'm, this is for the benefit of everybody watching and for people who may not be aware of uh, sort of the, the redevelopment board and how we were constituted. We were the first board in Massachusetts with this combined planning board under Mass General Law Chapter 40 and Chapter 41, um, and as a redevelopment authority under Chapter 121B. It's a really unique body, um, but we're, we're actually kind of limited with a very special focus and jurisdiction. It was formed under a home rule petition and the authorities that it has are derived from the Town Manager Act, as well as the Arlington Zoning Bylaw, uh, basically in the 1970s. The difference in our urban renewal authority or redevelopment authority rather, is that town meeting approval is required for two key actions, where in other redevelopment authorities, you don't always see this level of approval that's required. Um, and this was from the very beginning, so it's not, this was an intentional um, power that was provided to town meeting, which is that they can approve um, any uh, anytime the ARB wishes to move forward with an urban renewal project or rehabilitation um, project or wants to acquire property by eminent domain or otherwise, or borrows or agrees to borrow money, town meeting approval is required. So we can't act completely autonomously or independently we are embedded within the framework uh, whereby town meeting makes uh, approvals for things like this. Um, and, and town meeting makes that approval in our case as well. So um, 
that's on the urban renewal side. Obviously, I'm not going to go into the part about our, our planning functions, but in brief, you know, primarily the board reviews applications for certain projects to ensure specific uh, criteria are met under the environmental design review special permitting process. But this is really all about urban renewal. So we're going to, we're going to, if we want to talk about the planning board or the planning functions at another meeting and sort of uh, special permitting, we can. But for this conversation, we're talking about urban renewal because I think we want to get to a, a broader conversation about some of our underutilized properties on our main corridors. So this is directly from the state's website about urban renewal. Urban renewal in, you know, I'm not going to talk about the entire history of urban renewal in the United States, but it has a very unfortunate history, um, one that is connected to, uh, frankly, segregation, um, highway construction and redevelopment, urban renewal plans were the plans that were put into place that unfortunately led to the devastation of many neighborhoods uh, throughout the entire country um, and led to displacement of uh, businesses and families and individuals um, who had very little power or say in the process. So urban renewal itself as a, as a law um, and as an act comes from a very challenging place in the United States, the history of planning in the United States and um, where it, we are, we have to live with some of these terms that are in, that are baked into what is called urban renewal today, including words like substandard and decadent and blighted. Those are all part of uh, the, the wording and phrasing uh, that's embedded in renewal. So if you see this language, it's, it's simply because that's the way that it's phrased. Um, but the idea is to really find a way to redevelop areas that are struggling to uh, redevelop. Um, that, that's the way that it is primarily used today. Um, and it functions as really an opportunity to direct investment into areas that are not uh, receiving as much investment as they possibly could from both the public side as well as the private side. And so what that means is um, there's a, you know, there's a legacy of how we've done that in Arlington and it's led to pretty much two urban renewal plans um, in the history of the time that the ARB has been in, in existence. So, um, you know, we, we can do this buying and selling and holding of property, but Arlington Town Meeting Action is required to take those activities. So for example, the Arlington Center Conservation and Improvement uh, Project was really the first urban renewal plan. And it had a, a pretty long time period before anything was realized. It was used to revamp Arlington Center primarily, but it also gave the redevelopment board the authority to ultimately manage and lease the three buildings that we still manage and lease, which is the former central school building um, or the junior high school building or lots of different ways of putting it, um, which is at 20 Academy Street and 27 Maple Street. That is where the, the community center is located as well as other entities. Um, 23 Maple Street, which is the building next door, and the Jefferson Cutter House, which was moved to the site at 611 Massachusetts Avenue. That's on the corner of uh, Mass Ave and uh, Medford. Um, so, I'm sorry, I said Medford Street. I don't know why I said Medford Street. I was thinking <laughs> thinking down the block. Uh, it's, it's right at the center, uh, at, the, uh, at the crossroads in the center. What was that? I think you're believe you're referring to Mystic Street. In Mystic, yes, it's Mystic and Old Mystic. We actually created the park that is there today, which is Whittemore Park. We um, also relocated that building um, from what was uh, formerly at the Myrac property uh, down Mass Ave. Um, so all of that came to be as a result of that urban renewal plan. And it took from 1978 to 1984 for the whole thing to be realized. So 1978 was when 9.4 acres were designated as an urban renewal project. And the funding plan was approved and it was established. And it was all based on a planning process that some of you might have seen. And um, there's a beautiful, nice bound book of a Mill Millbrook Valley uh, comprehensive plan. Um, and also the Arlington Center Comprehensive Plan. So it was after a planning process took place. Um, by 1979, the draft urban renewal plan and maps were approved by town meeting. Um, the following years, the budget was approved for the project. And then the plan was really coming into formation. 
It was amended in 82. Um, the work was starting. Um, it included the transfer of the central school building to the redevelopment board because it had previously been the school department as well as the zoning being amended to allow for that public private use of the space the way it is still today. Um, and that led to uh, what was called a card plan back in that time in the 80s, which is a commercial area revitalization district, um, which also in, in all of these situations, it leveraged a lot of capital and funding, not just from the town side, but also a lot of state grant funding. Um, the urban renewal plan in the center actually expired in 2011. And then fast forward a lot of years um, later, we have uh, the Sims Arlington Conservation and Improvement Project. That was approved to redevelop the former Sims Hospital property. Probably for some of the people who are here tonight or listening or watching, um, this, this is a very long project uh, that came to be after a lot of planning um, and a lot of process. And uh, there are a lot of twists and turns along the way. That's the easiest way to put it. Um, it's now home to Arlington 360 in Brightview. It was, the plan ultimately was approved in 2002 um, and amended in May of 2003. There is a land dis disposition agreement um, which was accepted in 2004 to 2005. The plan actually expires in January. Um, so back when we did the Arlington Center plan, they were 40 year plans. Um, and DHCD typically doesn't recommend anything longer than 20 years any longer. So the plan ultimately expires within 20 years of the date that the, the original plan was accepted. So um, what exactly can you do with an urban renewal plan? You can do a lot of things um, and there's many different eligible activities, everything from obviously you know, preparing the plan itself, but also potentially carrying out a variety of planning studies, establishing different standards for what you wanna see put in place, um, there's the acquisition component, there's demolition potentially, um, there's site preparation or environmental mitigation or remediation. Um, there could be other environmental issues that have to be addressed um, for improving the property. Um, potentially there's relocation if, you know, especially if you're acquiring a property and there's currently businesses or tenants that are um, located there. Um, as well as, of course, uh, cobbling together all of the funding sources that are required to make something happen. So all of that are, all of these things are eligible for action. The criteria for, um, for meeting urban renewal um, and getting approved by DHCD is based upon a number of determinations. Um, and, and I think that it speaks back to why do you do urban renewal planning to begin with, which is you, you're, you have a situation where Without some sort of public action, a particular site or property or a project more broadly, like a revitalization plan for a, a neighborhood or a specific you know, commercial area could not, without that action, nothing is going to move forward or very, very little would be developed. Um, and so the public action is essentially necessary and essential. And you of course have to prove that in your urban renewal plan process. Um, additionally, your, the, the other criteria would be the project is promoting some desired investment by private entities and private could be for-profit, it could also be nonprofit. In most cases involving urban renewal planning today, it is often nonprofit organizations, including community development corporations because many, many urban renewal plans end up happening in places where they have sort of a similar setup to us with an entitlement community, um, you know, community development block grant and other federal funds are uh, easier to, to um, access um, or they're in a gateway city. Um, so there's a, you know, a connection, a nexus to um, leveraging a certain kind of private investment. Um, and often a number of community development corporations that can participate. Um, the plan for financing the project is sound. It has to be reasonable. It has to make sense. Um, the project area has to be designated as substandard decadent and or blighted under the, the law. Um, the plan submission is complete and it includes a relocation plan if it's appropriate. It also has to include 
a variety of components, the whole description of the project area, that's, that includes the map with the, the boundaries, it's very descriptive. Um, because it also might include um, covenants like um, deed restrictions that limit, um, you know, affordability requirements and regulations could have other restrictions like, for example, our um, LDA for the Sims property includes conservation restrictions and uh, very prescribed agreements for certain parts of the site. Um, all of that ties back to those proposed boundaries that are designated in the urban renewal plan. Um, a description of the conditions, um, the project objectives and anticipated impacts of the proposed redevelopment activities, um, proposed relocation again, any proposed public improvements, because ideally you're creating a plan that is not just about directing private investment or private actors to do different things to reinvest in this project or area, but you're also demonstrating that uh, you know, the, the municipality is going to devote a certain amount of, of funding in order to make something happen. Um, the description, of course, of the parcel, which includes the property owner, current zoning or land use, um, and any proposed zoning amendments, um, and the requirements that might be um, needed in order to make things pass. The financial plan, project implementation timeline, of course, community participation, and then all of the municipal approvals that are required as part of that process. Lastly, but of, of course not, not the least important is the, uh, what is called MEPA, Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act review and approval. In the urban renewal plan, you only have to note what the status is of such a review. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. That was the end of urban renewal planning. So how about I turn it back to you, Rachel? Great. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate you taking us through all of that, the history yep. of some of the plans. You're welcome. Um, and I'll go back to any slide if necessary. That sounds great. Why don't I um, run through the list of board members and uh, ask you for any questions that you might like to direct towards Jenny? And I'll start with Eugene. Uh, yeah, this is very helpful, Jenny. I don't have any immediate questions. I would to ask if you post your presentation somewhere where we can all downloaded. I think that would be helpful. Yes. I will be posting the presentation. Yes. Thank you. Great. Oh, I guess I have one other question. Do you think that the board has the authority to go through town meeting and do an eminent domain taking without creating an urban renewal plan? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jean. I'll go to Ken next. No, I don't have a question right now. Uh, I, I think I want to reserve question for a little later. Great. Uh, go to Melissa next. Any questions for Jenny? Jenny, in the past, where have um, these plans been, been initiated from in terms of, you know, if they're initiatives, are they driven by the ARB? Are they driven by town meeting? Or um, where are they coming from? Right, that's a good question, actually. Um, the, uh, the Arlington Center one, I would say, came from probably a combination of the town manager at the time, as well as the director of planning and community development, um, as well as the redevelopment board. So it was uh, sort of this, uh, a, lot, <laughs> a lot of town leaders working together on that plan um, with support from the finance committee um, and other bodies that, who were interested in the revitalization of Arlington Center. And it was a, you know, a, an, a, an entire planning process that led to the urban renewal plan being developed. So other players, you know, and, and constituents in the community were very much participating in those processes as well, um, including people who had an interest in environmental issues, you know, historic preservation, um, uh, you know, all, pretty much, you know, all the committees and, and boards and commissions who we usually uh, work or coexist with were participating in some way um, as part of that process, but it was led by the department, the redevelopment board, and the town manager at the time. Great, thanks. I, I guess I didn't mention the select board, but that's that's probably mm -hmm. an important body to also reference. Thanks. Um, um, and so the other plan, yeah. you know, Sims, the Sims property was 
definitely uh, led by a number of other of, of the similar groups in the community who obviously were interested in the redevelopment of the of the hospital site. Um, a, a very long process it included, uh, you know, developing a committee, an advisory committee that helped with the you know neighborhood issues, the planning issues, um, and there I'm pretty sure that there are a couple of people who are participating on this call who participated or are certainly familiar with that process, but it was, that was also quite a process uh, prior to 2002 to get to that place, but also led by uh, the then Director of Planning and Community Development. If I could add, I think the triggering factor was when the Sims Hospital decided it would close right. and sell the property and the town under some ancient deed or something had the right of first refusal to buy the property. So that was the um, animating event that started that whole thing. Right, yeah, and I would say the, that's a good way to phrase it, the animating event. The animating event for Arlington Center was disinvestment, uh, the desire to rework the roadways the desire to have commercial improvements, you know, it was, it was part of those sort of overarching strategies. I think the redevelopment board's participation in the Sims project came, was a little bit later on in the process because we had that event that you mentioned, Jean, but then uh, it was sort of turned to the redevelopment board to create the urban renewal plan and move forward with it. And again, after a long process with the hospital. And also with consideration of, <laughs> many different potential uses and outcomes and ultimately what is there today is after a very long period of, of uh, many, many different options that were vetted as well as developers. Great. Thanks, Jenny. You're welcome. Any other questions, Melissa? Um, I'll, I'll hold off at this point. Okay, great, thank you. Steve, any questions for Jenny? I do have two questions. Uh, first, could you describe what a blighted open area is? And you could use Arlington Center as an example <laughs> if it helps for context. Um, well, you might say a parking lot is a blighted open area. Um, uh, it's, a, it's potentially high value, underutilized, down zoned, and uh, not necessarily very attractive, perhaps degrading the environment, um, in poor condition, poorly lit, poorly maintained. This is just an example. It's not necessarily what is happening in Arlington Center, but mm -hmm. that, that might be the type of thing that would be a blighted open area. Another thing would be a, a park that is not quite a park, but sort of an open space that's vacant um, and also underutilized and um, might be sort of the missing piece on a block because a building was taken down and it's just sort of vacant um, and could be turned into some sort of different use or it could be improved into a park, a pocket park. I mean, there, there could be other things that are used for it, but it's basically, that's, the, that's what they're talking about when they say the open area. Okay, and my second question is, I kind of get the sense that in order um, before one of these plans would be approved, you really have to have your ducks in a, in a row in terms of uh, the area affected, what you intend to do with it, um, how the funding will and budgeting will work, and possibly you know who might be doing the work. Is 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 that accurate? I would say everything up to who's going to do the work, because the the board actually um, can be in a position of determining through. Um, and, and being exempt through of, uh, for compliance with 30B, which is typically something that we have to comply with, the urban renewal plan takes that out of the mix. So we have uh, basically sort of the authority to choose developers. It could be a master developer. It could be um, working with a number of different uh, types of developers, for-profit, non-profit, um, some sort of hybrid. Um, so there, there's actually a lot of options. You, so everything up to that part, you have to pretty much do have lined up. Um, and that's ideally coming from a process that was well-planned and thought through and, fi and financing is in place. But to carry out the actual parcel development, that could happen over a period of time. 
which is to the point of having, let's say, a 20 year plan, um, you might not know the end result in year you know, three, but you could sort of project what you would like to have happen. That's sort of the proposed improvements. Um, but you don't necessarily know and, and or have to specify who's going to be carrying out that work. Great. Thank you much. That's very helpful. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Jenny before we move to the second part of the presentation? Just one last one, Rachel. Um, Jenny, in our master plan, does it outline or indicate any recommendations for urban renewal plans? Did it Not consider that? Aware that? Of, no. Did it, did it understand or did the consultants understand the ARB's role as a redevelopment authority when they were doing this? I mean, I don't, I don't know if they understood. I would, only, I would guess that they understood that because they've noted, you know, in the zoning audit, and there's um, certainly times where the the ARB is is certainly called out as uh, implementing parts of the plan. But you know, whether or not we talked about the powers that we're discussing tonight um, as part of that process, I I don't know if it might have come up. I would. I hope it did. Um, nothing landed into the plan itself though. <laughs> right, right. I just, it seems like it's a tool that seems almost overlooked in the master plan. That's a good point. Thank you, Melissa. All right, I think let's go ahead and move into the second part of the presentation um, and we'll pause for questions after, after that. Okay. All right, thank you everybody. Um, so I'll, and then at the end, we can open it up to anybody else with questions. I'm happy to- We'll open it up. Go back uh, to grab everything. Public you. questions, yeah. Okay. Um, so this part is about sort of the fact that we have, I think that we named at least four properties that are underutilized, um, potentially blighted, um, meeting some of this criteria. So this, this uh, part of the presentation is brief to talk about some potential strategies and some uh, funding sources and other options. So um, first I'll just kind of go, go back again to the kind of the first part. I, I think that when you're talking about a particular property, you're, you're also talking about the impact on the area. You know, it, it's, it isn't really ever just about, it would be nice if just a property lived all by itself, but it, it doesn't, it has an impact on the neighborhood. It has an impact on the surrounding environment. We may not, we may not be able to specifically articulate what that is, but I think we pr probably could dig into it a little bit more. So a successful revitalization planning process would cultivate a lot of different components to be, you know, to what I think to, could be realized include some of the following things. The first one is kind of the, is, is maybe obvious, but is always worth saying, is that you, you really have to have some champions of these things that can't, it would not be best if it was only the redevelopment board. We need other people to be active voices and leaders as part of the process. And we want to engage uh, diverse constituencies in that conversation. So it can't, it can't be limited to just us talking about it. It has to be broader than that. And the leadership should also be diverse. Um, it should articulate a much clear, a very clear and compelling vision. What do we really want to see in the future for either that site, um, as well as the sort of surrounding impacts, potentially um, sort of the outcome, if you will, what's the compelling vision for, for addressing the blight? Um, it should recognize and find a way to capitalize on existing assets. And I think for Arlington, there's so many. Uh, I mean, there's, we're talking about, you know, historic and cultural resources um, that abound, particularly along our main corridors, Mass Ave and Broadway. Um, we have wonderful parks and recreational opportunities. We have the Minuteman Bikeway. Um, there's a lot of assets that we, as a community stand to be able to capitalize on. And a lot of that planning has been taking place and took place of course in the past. Um, I think that there's a way though in a successful plan to recognize and find a way to really leverage all of that. Um, and I didn't mention the Millbrook, but it's also worth mentioning that 
you know, a, a project that really finds a way to capitalize on that asset is, is just as important in the community. Um, it also would assemble resources to strengthen commercial areas as well as the neighborhood more broadly. So ideally that investment in the property, if it's only one property, is sort of has a spillover effect, um, either from public resources or private resources. And then lastly, it's, um, there's this, this also, I, I'm certain you also know this, but there's never, you know, one thing that solves all the problems. It's a lot of tools and different policies that are, are tied together in sort of a, um, a complex package that ultimately addresses uh, both revitalization needs, but also promotes the assets. And to get there, it's probably some combination of zoning amendments, overlay districts, incentives and bonuses, maybe tax abatements. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities in terms of how you can address these issues. I actually think that we have a lot of funding options. Um, just giving this some thought, um, not only do we have local resources, including the CDBG program, the CPA funding uh, for things like economic development and historic preservation, but there's also uh, the ability to leverage some great state resources. Um, the mass development program that I'm noting here is, I only um, have information about the this current fiscal year program, but I understand that it's been funded in future fiscal years. Um, it's called the Underutilized Properties Program, and this one seems like a, a you know, a good potential opportunity. Um, we have gone after Mass Historical Commission Preservation Project Fund money. It does have to be tied, you know, most of these uh, funding sources usually work together and they serve as a match. Um, depending upon what the proposed uses are of a property, there's so many other potential funding sources, including housing trust funds at the state level, um, environmental remediation options, uh, tax credit programs, and other state resources. Um, while we don't have much funding in the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund, I also wanted to note that it is under state law as the way that it's constituted, it may also accept and receive property. It could be a, a, have the ability to purchase or retain real or personal property, um, can go through a variety of legal transactions. It can manage property. And of course it can hold property and then um, dispose of it at an appropriate time when the trustees feel it's appropriate. Um, this is an abbreviated list of the functions of the trust, um, just focused on real property development. So this is just sort of a, a list of references that when I post this document, this uh, presentation, people will be able to go to some of these sources to see a little bit more. And this is actually the end of my presentation. Thank you, Jenny. You're welcome. Uh, I'll go through our list of board members for any questions on this section, starting with Jean. Yeah, thanks. Um, again, this was very helpful. I guess the one question I have, and I think I once knew this and don't remember anymore, is does DHCD have actual regulations on this, on, or is it just guidance that they use on things like um, the criteria they use to determine whether to approve an urban renewal plan? Oh, they have criteria. You have to meet, it's under there it, and it's it's totally, uh, everything is approved by and must be reviewed and approved by DHCD. No, I mean, do they have a set of regulations that they use to do that or is it all oh, guidance? No, it's all regulatory and that's all posted on the on DHCD's website. Okay. I, I'll, I'll share that. I'll put that in the link at the end, actually. Great, yeah, that would be helpful, thanks. Anything else, Jane? Nope, that's it. Okay, great. I'll go to Ken. Yeah, Jenny, when we talk about blighted properties, um, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm trying to get a better understanding of the scale of what you call blighted property. I mean, is this one piece of property here and then three, four blocks down later is another one? So the whole area is considered um the urban renewal area or is just um uh, spot um i don't know what what you call it spot blight or however you want to call that 
Uh, how's that? That's what it's called, actually. Um, there's spot blight and there's area blight. Those are the oh. two different designations. There's also a separate category for emergencies. But spot blight is when we're talking about one single property or parcel. An area blight would be more like a, you know, a block or a neighborhood or a district. You know, it could get big. Um, so we're okay. talking about, I think we're mostly talking about spot blight. Spot blight. Yes, meaning one property or building. Okay. Uh, all right. That, that makes uh, okay, that makes it clear. I was a little confused, but all right. Yeah, it, it and it's not unusual for a community, again, especially with uh, the, the characteristics that Arlington has that I mentioned, to think about spot blight versus, uh, you know, more the broader area blight um, or both. I just don't see Arlington having that right now, this big blocks and blocks of blight. Um, but I can see the other point where spot blight does exist here and there. But and I, I, can, I couldn't uh, grasp how you would go uh, approaching and applying this to those er different areas if I didn't. Uh, but spot blight, OK, makes sense. Yes, um, the framework that I'm talking about could be applied to a single parcel, or it could be applied to a block or a neighborhood or a district. It's the same regardless of the scale. It's just if it's a bigger scale, it obviously needs more resources. But it's the same. It's it's it is actually the same exact process, including the same process for an urban renewal plan. If you were going to just designate one parcel. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Melissa, any questions for Jenny on the second part? Nope. Uh, going to Steve. Uh, no questions, Madam Chair. Great. And, you know, I, I was also going to ask questions in the same vein as Ken. It's almost, you know, when you have a few nodes of spot white, does it make more sense in some cases to look at uh, a neighborhood or a series of blocks? Um, if you can identify, you know, I can think of instances where there might be two or three locations which significantly undermine the ability of an entire neighborhood to um, live up to its potential. And in that case, um, would you typically treat that as um, looking at the individual parcels or looking at the, the neighborhood and the overall effects in general when you're looking at this type of analysis? For the urban renewal plan process, you'd have to look at both. You'd have to talk yeah. about each individual property um, and you'd have to then to also talk about the area. And especially when we're talking about Arlington, that's the case because of our zoning map. Um, because each individual parcel sometimes side by side have different zoning uh, district designations and requirements. Um, so if you were talking about, let's say a block in Arlington Heights um, or, um, well, yeah, let's just say Arlington Heights. Uh, you might be talking about six different business districts um, in that in that stretch of that entire corridor. Right. Um, and so you'd talk about the entire area and the proposed um, impact or you know uh, the vision that you're looking to achieve, but you'd also talk about all the individual parcels and what needs to be done. Right. And I think that if you're talking about an individual parcel you're talking about that parcel, but you're also talking about sort of the effect that that redevelopment might have on um, is sort of the, the pulse beyond it um, that it would send if it was redeveloped to surrounding properties. Whether that means, you know, just uh, thinking of things that could happen like improvements to sidewalks, um, improvements to playgrounds, um, you know, that those are like sort of on the public side or, um, other, you know, rehabilitation of properties um, or, um, you know, changes of use uh, that encourages commercial activity. I mean, there's, there's many different things that could potentially happen as spillovers, but you'd have to catalog that as part of looking at an individual site as well. Great. Any other questions? 
Great. Well, I think at this point, we will open it up um, to any uh, public comment or any questions that uh, those people who are joining us, us this evening might have. So if you do have a question for Jenny or the Redevelopment Board, uh, please go ahead and use the raise hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we will uh, call on, on anyone who wishes to speak this evening. Give you a few minutes. Uh, Don Seltzer, and before you begin, I'll just remind everyone who wishes to speak that you will, uh, to please introduce yourself by your first, last name, and address, and you'll have up to three minutes for your questions. Please go ahead, Don. Uh, thank you, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I really appreciate this presentation by Jenny. It's been quite informative. It was really nicely put together. Um, I was wondering, would this have applied in some way to the Mugar track over the many years? It seems that that's the closest thing to a really blighted area that we've had in Arlington um, over the last 50 years. Uh, I know it's a complicated issue and I suppose a lot has to do with the owner reluctance to cooperate in this case. And uh, the, the second question would be, um, do we have any particular target properties in mind at this st stage? I'm guessing that there's something behind this, then you're thinking of uh, maybe a few small spot blighted areas that the board could take action with. Great, thank you. Uh, Jenny, if you wanted to answer the, uh, uh, the first question, that would be great. Sure, yeah, um, and thank you for the words of appreciation, Don, I appreciate that. Um, I guess I would answer maybe that urban renewal plan could be applicable to the Mugar property. I mean, it, it it's the same as for any of the other things that we we're talking about tonight. It sort of depends upon a compelling vision, uh, reasoning for uh, needing to have an urban renewal plan for that particular property. Um, there could be very good reasons. I can think of some, um, but it would have to be very compelling, um, but it could be applicable. You know, again, to I, I answered the question about an open, what does it mean to be open and blighted? Um, I suppose some parts of that site might fit, might have or currently do uh, fit that characterization. Um, I think probably more eminent domain and uh, trying to acquire the property, which was long something that has been in lots of plans for the town of Arlington. Um, a desire expressed not only in our master plan, but in lots of other plans, including our open space and recreation plan, was to acquire the Mugar property to protect and preserve it. Um, so, you know, but urban renewal planning could have been potentially used hand in hand. Great, thank you, Jenny. Thank you. And Sure. So I'm sorry for your second question. I'll just note that um, at this point, the board is really uh, taking a look at all options um, available to us, noting that um, we have, as we've been looking at the uh, commercial corridors, identified that there are um, not necessarily specific properties, but there are opportunities which we've started to identify um, which have been contributing to a potentially contributing to a, um, a lack of development in the surrounding area. So understanding what the, um, what the potential options that the redevelopment board and um, all of the other uh, groups that need to come together for this type of urban renewal planning have in front of us, um, we thought was, was a timely discussion for us to have. But no specific names at this point, I gather. Uh, nothing, nothing specific. We haven't had any okay. type of discussion about that to build consensus as a board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments uh, from the uh, from the public who's joining us this evening? Okay, uh, seeing none, I will uh, close public comment and uh, open it back up to the board for any other questions for Jenny regarding uh, urban renewal planning. Okay, 
seeing none, what we would like to do at this point is to, um, let's see, we've uh, closed public comment and we are, would like to, um, I'd like to uh, propose that a member of the board um, move for us to move to an executive session. As stated in the agenda, we'd like to discuss the 821 Massachusetts Avenue property with uh, town council to explore um, potential ARB redevelopment options and or acquisition of the property. So this um, executive session, uh, at this executive session, we will then um, adjourn. Uh, we will not be reconvening into an open session after the executive session. So we will uh, need a motion and a second and then a roll call vote in order to enter into the executive session. Not a motion. Yes, nope. sorry, who was that? Uh, me or Steve, either way. I will say, I, okay. Madam Chair, I motion that the board um, close open hearing and convene in an executive session for the purposes stated in the last item of our agenda. Second. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So we'll go ahead and take a roll call vote, uh, starting with uh, Ken. Yes. Jean. Uh, yes, and I see town councils raised this hand. Uh, uh, Town Council is in the room now, uh, Doug. Hi. Great. Welcome, Doug. Did you have your I think you might have something a... you wanted to say before we finish the vote? Yes, I'm Please. so sorry to interrupt the vote. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, Mr. Revelock would be so amenable. You should state whether or not you're planning to reconvene an open session or adjourn from executive session. Right. So, Steve, if you could um, amend the motion, as I had mentioned before, I was suggesting that we will be uh, adjourning from the executive session. All right. So I will motion that uh, the board uh, close the open session of tonight's meeting, uh, move to an executive session for the purposes stated in the agenda with the board to adjourn after the executive session completes. Great, thank you, Steve, I appreciate it. And thank you, um, Doug, for reminding us to include that in the motion. Uh, so we have a second? Second. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote. Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I am a yes as well. So thank you, uh, everyone who has joined us this evening. And, uh, the members of the board and um, members of the Department of Planning and Doug Heim could remain on the line.